Welcome back. So we're talking about sparsity, compression, compressed sensing, and I want to take a step back and just think about kind of sparsity and parsimony uh, in modeling in general. Okay, so sparsity, as we've defined, basically means that you have some, some data, some vector or array that is mostly containing zeros. Uh, but what it also means in general is that out of many, many possible pieces of information, there are only a few pieces that actually matter to you. That's another way of thinking about sparsity. And so oftentimes you're going to hear me talk about uh, parsimonious models, okay? And parsimony is just a fancy word for greedy, but this isn't the bad kind of greedy. This is like uh, greedy in the sense that you want as little as possible, as few, you want as few descriptions as possible, as few pieces of information as you need to describe some data or some phenomena, but absolutely no more. So you want to be greedy in how many numbers you need to describe something, or greedy in terms of how many terms in a model you use to fit some physical process. So parsimony can be a good thing. Um, remember Gordon Gecko from Wall Street, greed is good. Sometimes greed can be good. Um, in fact, that's one of my favorite papers, is a 2004 paper by Joel Tropp titled Greed is Good, where he goes on to show uh, kind of the remarkable properties of sparse optimization and greedy optimization for uh, robust, uh, robustly solving, solving problems in linear algebra, okay? So sparsity is mathematically how we often promote parsimony in our models, in our solutions, in our signals, in our optimizations in general. So if we're optimizing, uh, for example, in machine learning, you're trying to build models to fit data. Now, do you want a million degrees of freedom that you can tweak and use to fit your, your data and your model? Maybe, but that's not a very parsimonious solution. Maybe if there is a model that is almost as good, but it's got three <laughs> degrees of freedom, three parameters, I'm going to go with that one every day, okay? Every time. I want the parsimonious model. Uh, and again, parsimony for us often means sparsity, promoting sparsity in our optimization and in our solution. Okay, this idea is absolutely not new. So I'm just gonna walk you through a couple of examples of uh, kind of how other people have thought about parsimony and sparsity in modeling uh, the physical world before us, okay? So I love this quote by Einstein, everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. This is a great uh, encapsulation of this principle of parsimony. He's talking about physical laws and models. So you want to distill things down to the absolute essentials, the simplest description you need to describe your observations, but no simpler, because then you can't describe your observations. So he may well have been talking about Newton's second law, F equals MA, which is kind of this, uh, it's the poster child for a parsimonious model. It's so simple, yet it describes so much. Or Einstein's own E equals MC squared. Very, very simple, extremely descriptive. You can't go simpler and still describe what we observe in the world. Okay, so that's, uh, that's a great encapsulation of this principle of parsimony. Many of you have heard of Occam's razor. Um, with all things being equal, the simplest explanation tends to be the right one. This, uh, this is actually called lex parsimoni um, in Latin, which means the law of parsimony, or kind of the stingy law, the greedy law, the law that you, know, you want the absolute simplest explanation, that's typically the right one, okay? So Occam's razor uh, is, a, is a great kind of formalization of, of this concept. It goes farther back. Um, it goes back, uh, I believe Aristotle had his own principle of parsimony, uh, which might not surprise many of you. Again, Newton observed this as well. Uh, if you're modeling the same natural effects, we must, as far as possible, assign the same causes. It would be too complicated to say that different physics governs uh, different instances of the same motion. So for example, Galileo, uh, you know, in his, his ball drop experiment where he dropped different balls off of the Tower of Giza, was, was using this basic idea that you can't have different physics governing you know, two different balls. They're probably governed by the same causes. And that's, uh, again, formalized by Newton in his, in his laws of motion. Okay, so he took that observational data and he formalized this into an extremely parsimonious law. Good. 
Um, many of you have heard of the Pareto rule, the 80-20 rule, that roughly 80% of the effects come from 20% of the causes. This is another take on that kind of uh, parsimonious principle and, and Occam's razor, okay? You can generally explain most things with a relatively few or simple set of causes. Okay, so uh, 80 20 is related. Um, if you go all the way back, actually, I find this, this uh, really interesting. Ptolemy had the, uh, the Ptolemaic system of how, how planets move in their orbits, right? So they, this is back in the Roman days. He was describing the motion of planets and stars, and he had this very simple description uh, of circles on circles on circles. This theory, although it's not uh, physically correct, right? Newton and Kepler uh, kind of uh, dethroned this this theory 1500 years later, this idea stuck around for a really long time, 15 centuries, because as he explained it, this was the simplest hypothesis possible, and it did a really good job of describing the observational data. So the principle of parsimony, uh, to some extent, is what kept the Ptolemaic system in place for 1500 years, okay, until we had an even simpler explanation for, for the motion of the planets, okay? So I kind of want to uh, summarize a little bit how we're going to use this uh, and why we think this is important. Okay, so in the modern era, we are building models from data. That is machine learning. Machine learning is an optimization framework to build models from data. And parsimony is just as important as it ever was, maybe more important, when we're now training our computers to model the world uh, instead of doing it ourselves. So parsimonious or sparse models are still important today. They have the property that by reducing the amount of free variables or parameters as much as possible to the simplest possible explanation, you tend to prevent overfitting. If I have a million degrees of freedom that I get to tweak, a million parameters, a very complicated, non-parsimonious model, if I'm, if I'm liberal with my parameters, then I might very well overfit and get something that looks right on my data but doesn't have the root cause kind of encapsulated. Okay, so parsimonious or sparse models tend to over tend to prevent overfitting. I say sparse, meaning as few parameters or as few terms as possible. Okay, that's what we mean by sparse. Uh, these models generally are more interpretable because, again, if I have five parameters or five terms instead of a million terms, that's a lot less terms to try to understand and to communicate with other people, to try to analyze. Okay, so sparse, parsimonious models generally are more interpretable. Uh, they are the models that require the fewest terms needed to model the data. That, that's what we mean by sparse or parsimonious models. And generally, they're robust, uh, they prevent overfitting, they remain interpretable. This is what we want in modeling, okay? So uh, we're gonna talk about sparsity and compression and the mathematics of, of, uh, of sparse vectors and sparse arrays, but I want you to remember why we care so much about this, aside from the compression angle, is that in machine learning, in the world of, of modeling with data, we, again, we still want parsimonious models. We still want to remember the words of Einstein and Newton uh, and Pareto, these are important. We need to adhere to Occam's razor when we model physical systems, okay? So parsimonious or stingy uh, models are often the ones that, that I personally, personally want. Okay, thank you.